Warfighting, MCDP-1, United States Marine Corps. Narrated by a Marine Corps infantry combat veteran of two wars and two historic battles and former combat instructor at the School of Infantry. Chapter 1. The Nature of War. Positions are seldom lost because they have been destroyed, but almost invariably because the leader has decided in his own mind that the position cannot be held. A. A. Vandegriff. To understand the Marine Corps' philosophy of warfighting, we first need an appreciation for the nature of war. Itself, its moral, mental, and physical characteristics and demands. A common view of war among Marines is necessary base for the development of a cohesive doctrine because our approach to the conduct of war derives from our understanding of the nature of war. War defined. War is a violent clash of interests between or among organized groups, characterized by the use of military force. These groups have traditionally been established nation-states, but may also include any non-state group, such as international coalition or a faction within or outside an existing state, with its own political interests, and the ability to generate organized violence on a scale sufficient to have significant political consequences. The essence of war is a violent struggle between two hostile, independent, and irreconcilable wills, each trying to impose itself on the other. War is fundamentally an interactive social process. Clausewitz called it Zivenkamp, literally a two-struggle. It suggests the image of a pair of wrestlers locked in a hold, each exerting force and counterforce to th try to throw the other. War is thus a process of continuous mutual adaptation, of give and take, move and counter-move. It is critical to keep in mind that the enemy is not an inanimate object to be acted upon, but an independent, animate force with its own objectives and plans. While we try to impose our will on the enemy, he resists us and seeks to impose his own will on us. Appreciating this dynamic interplay between opposing wills is essentially to understanding the fundamental nature of war. The object in war is to oppose our will on the enemy. The means to this end is the organized application or threat of violence by military force. The target of that violence may be limited to hostile combative forces, or it may be extended to the enemy population at large. War may range from an intense clashes between large military forces, sometimes backed by an official declaration of war, to settler unconventional hostilities that barely reach the threshold of violence. Total war and perfect peace rarely exist in practice. Instead, they are extremes, between which exist the relations among political groups. This range includes routine economic competition, more or less permanent political or ideological tension, occasions, crises amongst groups, the decision to resort to the use of military force of some kind may arise at any point within these extremes, and even during periods of relative peace. On the end of the spectrum, military force may be used simply to maintain or restore order in civil disturbances or disaster relief operations. At some extreme, forces may be used to completely overturn the existing order within the society or between two or more societies. Some cultures consider it a moral imperative to go to war only as a last resort when all peaceful methods to settle disagreements have failed. Others have no such hesitancy to resort to military force to achieve their aims. Friction Portrayed as a clash between two opposing wills, 
War becomes extremely difficult because of the countless factors that impinge upon it. These factors collectively have been called friction, which Clausewitz described as a force that makes the apparently easy so difficult. Friction is a force that resists all action and saps energy. It makes simple difficult and difficult impossible. The very essence of war is a clash between opposing wills. This dynamic environment of interacting forces, friction abounds. Friction may be mental, as in indecision over a course of action. It may be physical, as in an ineffective enemy fire or terrain obstacle that must be overcome. Friction may be external, imposed on by enemy action. The terrain, the weather, or more chance. Friction may be self-induced, caused by such factors such as the lack of a clearly defined goal, lack of coordination, unclear or complicated paths, complex task organizations or command relationships, or complicated technologies. Whatever form it takes, because war is a human enterprise, friction will always have a psychological as well as physical impact. While we should attempt to minimize self-induced friction, the greater the requirement to fight effectively despite the existence of friction, one essentially means to overcome friction is the will. We prevail over friction through persistent strength of mind and spirit while starving ourselves to overcome the effects of friction. We must attempt at the same time, to raise our enemy's friction to a level that weakens his ability to fight. We can readily identify countless examples of friction, but until we have experienced it ourselves, we cannot hope to appreciate it fully. Only through experience can we come to appreciate the force of the will necessary to overcome friction and to develop a realistic expectation for what is possible in war and what is not. While training should attempt to approximate the conditions of war, we must realize that it can never fully duplicate the level of friction of real combat. Uncertainty Another attribute of war is uncertainty, and we might argue that uncertainty is just one of many sources of friction. But because it is such a pervasive trait of war, we will treat it singingly. All actions in war take place in an atmosphere of uncertainty, or the fog of war. Uncertainty pervades the battle in the form of unknowns about the enemy, about the environment, and even about friendly situation. While we try to reduce these unknowns by gathering information, we must realize that we cannot eliminate them or even come close. The very nature of war makes certainty impossible. All Actions in war will be based on incomplete, inaccurate, or even contradictory information. War is intrinsically unpredictable. At best, we can hope to determine possibilities and probabilities. This implies a certain standard of military judgment. What is possible and what is not? What is possible... By judging probability, we can make an estimate of our enemy's designs and act accordingly. Having said this, we realize that this is precisely those actions that seem improbable that we have often have the greatest impact on the outcome of war. Because we can never eliminate uncertainty, we must learn to fight effectively despite it. We can do this by developing simple, flexible plans, planning for likely contingencies, developing standing operating procedures, and fostering initiative among subordinates. 
One important source of uncertainty is a property known as nonlinearity. Here, the term does not refer to formations in the battlefield, but describes systems in which causes and effects are disproportionate. Minor incidents or actions can have decisive effects. Outcomes of battles can hinge on the actions of a few individuals, and as Clausewitz observed, issues can be decided by chances, and incidents so minute as a figures in history simply as anecdotes. By this nature, uncertainty invariably involves estimation of acceptance of risk. Risk is inherent in war and is involved in every mission. Risk is equally common to action and inaction. Risk may be related to gain. Greater potential gain often rewards greater risk. The practice of concentrating combat power towards the main effort necessitates the willingness to accept prudent risk elsewhere. However, we should clearly understand that the acceptance of risk does not equate the imprudent willingness to gamble and the entire likelihood of success on a single improbable event. Part of uncertainty is the ungovernable element of chance. Chance is universally characteristic of war and is a continuous source of friction. Chance consists of turns of events that cannot reasonably be foreseen over which we and our enemy have no control. Constant potential for chance influences outcomes in war, combined with the inevitable to prevent chance from impacting on plans and actions, creates a psychological friction. However, we should remember that chance favors neither belligerent exclusively. Consequently, we must view chance not only as a threat, but also as an opportunity which we must be ever ready to exploit. Fluidity. Like friction and uncertainty, fluidity in is, is an inherent attribute of war. Each episode in war is the temporary result of unique combination of circumstance, presenting a unique set of problems and requiring an original solution. Nevertheless, no episode can be viewed in isolation. Regardless, each episode merges with those that precede and follow it, shaped by the former and shaping conditions of the latter, creating a continuous fluctuating flow of activity replete with fleeting opportunities and unforeseen events. Since war is a fluid phenomenon, its conduct requires flexibility of thought. Success depends in large part on the ability to adapt, to proactively shape changing events, to our advantage as well as to react quickly and consistently to changing situations. It is physically impossible to sustain a high tempo of activity indefinitely, although clearly there will be times when it's advantageous to push men and equipment to the limit. The tempo of war will fluctuate from periods of intense combat to periods in which activity is limited to just information gathering, replenishment, or redeployment. Darkness and weather can influence the tempo of war, but need not halt it. A competitive rhythm will develop between the opposing wills, which each belligerent trying to influence and exploit tempo and continuous flow of events to suit his purposes. Military forces will mass to concentrate combat power against the enemy. However, this massing will also make them vulnerable to effects of enemy fires, and they will find it necessary to disperse. Another competitive rhythm that will develop. Disperse, concentrate, and disperse again. As each belligerent tries to concentrate combat power, 
temporarily, limiting the vulnerability to the enemy combat power, disorder in an environment of friction, uncertainty, and fluidity. War gravitates naturally towards disorder. Like other attributes of war, disorder is an inherent characteristic of war, and we can never eliminate it. In the heat of battle, plans will go awry. Instructions and information will be unclear and misinterpreted. Communications will fail, and mistakes and unforeseen events will be commonplace. It is precisely this natural disorder which creates conditions ripe for exploitation and opportunistic will. Each encounter in war will usually tend to grow increasingly disordered over time. As the situation changes continuously, we are forced to improvise again and again until finally our actions have little, if any, resemblance to the original scheme. By historical standards, the modern battlefield is particularly disorderly. While past battlefields could be described by linear formations and uninterrupted linear fronts, we cannot think of today's battlefield in linear terms. The range and lethality of modern weapons has increased dispersion between units. In spite of communications technology, this dispersion strains the limits of positive control. The natural result of dispersion is in unoccupied areas, gaps, and exposed flanks, which can and will be exploited. Blurring the distinction between the front and the rear, friendly and enemy-controlled areas. The occurrence of war will not unfold like clockwork. We cannot hope to impose precise positive control over events. The best we can hope for is to impose a general framework of order on the disorder to influence the general flow of action rather than to try to control each event. If we are to win, we must be able to operate in a disorderly environment. In fact, we must not only be able to fight effectively in the face of disorder, we should seek to generate disorder and use it as a weapon against our opponent complexity. War is a complex phenomenon, and we have described war as essentially a clash between opposed wills. In reality, each belligerent is not a single homogeneous will guided by a single intelligence. Instead, each belligerent is a complex system of consisting of numerous individual parts. A division comprises regiment, a regiment comprises battalions and so on the way down to the fire teams which are composed of individual marines. Each element is part of a larger whole and must cooperate with other elements for the accomplishment of the common goal. At the same time, each has its own mission and must adapt to its own situation. Each must deal with friction, uncertainty, and disorder in its own level. And each may create friction, uncertainty, and disorder for others, friendly as well as enemy. As a result, war is not governed by the actions or decisions of a single individual and hope any one place, but emerges from a collective behavior of all individual parts on the system interactively, locally, in response to local conditions and incomplete information. A military action is not a monolithic execution of a single decision by a single entity, but, ne ne but necessarily involves near countless independent but interrelated decisions. And actions being taken Simultaneously, throughout the organization, efforts to fully centralize military operations and to exert complete control over a single decision maker are inconsistent and intrinsically complex and distributed nature of war. 
the human dimension. Because war is a clash between opposing wills, the human dimension is central in war. And the human dimension, which infuses war in its intangible moral factors, war is shaped by human nature and is subject to the complexities, inconsistencies, and peculiarities which characterize human behavior. Since war is an act of violence based on irreconcilable disagreement, it will invariably inflame and shape human emotions. War is an extreme trial of moral and physical strength and stamina. Any view of the nature of war would hardly be accurate or complete without considerations of the effects of danger, fear, exhaustion, and privation of those who must do fighting. However, these effects are greatly from the case to case. Individuals and peoples react differently to the stresses of war, an act that may break the will of one human enemy and only serve to stifle the resolve of another. Human will, instilled throughout leadership, is the driving force in all action in war. No degree of technological development or scientific calculation will diminish the human dimension in war. Any doctrine which attempts to reduce warfare to ratios of forces, weapons, and equipment neglects the impact of the human will on the conduct of war and is therefore inherently flawed. Violence and danger. War is among the greatest horrors known to humanity. It should never be romanticized. This means of war is force applied in the form of organized violence. It is through this use of violence or credible threat of violence that we compel our enemy to do our will. Violence is the essential element of war. It is an immediate result of bloodshed, destruction, and suffering. While the magnitude of violence may vary with the object and means of war, the violent existence of war will never change. Any study of war that neglects this basic truth is misleading and incomplete. Since war is a violent enterprise, danger is ever-present. Since war is a human, a human phenomenon, Fear and human reaction to danger is a significant impact on the conduct of war. Everybody feels fear. Fear contributes to the corrosion of will. Leaders must foster courage to overcome fear, both individually and within the unit. Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the strength to overcome fear. Leaders must study fear, understand it, and be prepared to cope with it. Courage and fear are often situational rather than uniform, meaning that people experience them differently at different times in different situations. Like fear, courage takes many forms. From a stoic courage born of reason, calculated to the fierce courage born of heightened emotion, experience under fire generally increases confidence. As can realistic training by lessening the mystique of combat. Strong leadership, which earns the respect and trust of its subordinates, can limit the effects of fear. Leaders should develop unit cohesion, and esprit, and the self-confidence of individuals within the unit. In this environment, a Marine's unwillingness to violate the respect and trust of peers can overcome personal fear. Physical, moral, and mental forces. War is categorized by 
interaction of physical, moral, and mental forces. The physical characteristics of war are generally easily seen, understood, and measured. Equipment, capabilities, supplies, physical objectives seized, force ratios, losses of material or life, terrain lost or gained, prisoners or material captured. The moral characteristics are less tangible. The term moral, as used here, is not restricted to ethics. Although ethics are certainly included, but pertains to those forces of a psychological rather than tangible nature. Moral forces are difficult to grasp and impossible to, qual to quantify. We cannot easily gouge forces like a military resolve. National or individual consequence, emotion, fear, courage, morale, leadership, or esprit. War also gives a significant mental or intellectual component. Mental forces provide the ability to grasp complex battlefield situations and make effective estimates, calculations, and decisions to devise tactics and strategies to develop plans. Although material factors are more easily quantified, the moral and mental forces exert the greater influence over the nature of the outcome of war. This is not just to lessen the importance of the physical forces, but the physical forces in war which can have significant impact on others. For example, the greatest effect of fires is generally not the amount of physical destruction they cause, but the effect of physical destruction on the enemy's moral strength. Because of this difficult to come to grips with the moral mental forces, it's tempting to exclude them from our study of war. However, any doctrine or theory of war that neglects these factors ignores the greater part of the nature of war. The evolution of war. War is both timeless and ever-changing. While the basic nature of war is consistent, the means and methods we use evolve continuously. Changes may be gradual in some cases and drastic in others. Drastic changes in war are the result of developments that drastically upset the equilibrium of war, such as a rifled boar, mass conscription, and the railroad. One major catalyst of change is the advancement of technology. As the hardware of war improves through technological development, so must tactical, operational, and strategic uses adapt to improved capabilities, both to maximize our own capabilities and counteract the enemies. It is important to understand which aspects of war are likely to change and which are not. We must stay abreast of the process of change for the belligerent who first exploits a development in the art and science of war gains a significant advantage. And if we are ignorant, of that changing face of war, we will find ourselves unequal to its challenges. The science, art, and dynamic of war. Various aspects of war will fall principally in the realm of science, which is the methodological, uh, methodical application of the empirical laws of nature. Science of war includes those activities directly subject to the laws of ballistics, mechanics, and like disciplines. For example, the application of fires, the effects of weapons, the rates and methods of movement and resupply. However, science does not describe the whole phenomenon. Even the greater part of conduct of war falls around the realm of art, which is the employment of creative or intuitive skills. Art includes the creative situational application of scientific knowledge through judgment and experience. And so the art of war sublimes the science of war. The art of war requires intuitive ability to grasp the essence of a unique military situation and create Ability to devise a practical situation. In, it involves 
conceiving strategies and tactics and developing plans of action that suit a given situation. This still does not describe the whole phenomenon. Owing to the vulgarities of the human behavior and the countless other intangible factors which influence war, there is far more to its conduct than can be explained by the art and science. Art and science stop short of explaining the fundamental dynamic of war. As we have said, war is a social phenomenon. Its essential dynamic is the dynamic of competitive human interaction rather than the dynamic art of science. Human beings interact with each other in ways that are fundamentally different than the way a scientist works with chemicals or formulas or the way an artist works with paints or musical notes. It's because of this dynamic of human interaction that fortitude, perseverance, boldness, esprit, and other traits are not explainable by art or science are so essential in war. Thus, concluding that the conduct of war is fundamentally a dynamic process of human competition requiring both the knowledge of science and the creativity of art, but driven ultimately by the power of the human will. Conclusion At first glance, war seems like a simple clash of interests. On closer examination, it reveals its complexity and takes shape as one of the most demanding and trying of human endeavors. War is an extreme test of will, friction and uncertainty, fluidity and disorder, the danger and its essential features. War displays a broad patterns that can be represented as probabilities, yet it remains fundamentally unpredictable. Each episode in the unique product the myriad of moral, mental, and physical forces. Individual causes and their effects can rarely be isolated. Minor actions and random incidents can have disproportionately large, even decisive, effects. While dependent on the laws of science and intuition and creativity of art, war takes its fundamental character from the dynamic of human interaction. Chapter 2. The Theory of War Invincibility lies in the defense, the possibility of victory in the attack. One defends when his strength is inadequate. He attacks when it is abundant. Sung Tzu. Battles are won by slaughter and maneuver. The greater the general, the more he contributes to maneuver, and the less he demands in slaughter. Winston Churchill Having arrived at a common view of the nature of war, we proceed to develop from the theory of war. Our theory of war will turn be the foundation of the way we prepare for and wage war. War as an act of policy. War is an extension of both policy and politics. With the addition of military force, policy and politics are related to but not synonymous. It is important to understand war in both contexts. Politics refers to the distribution of power through the dynamic interaction, both cooperative and competitive, while policy refers to the conscious objectives established within the political process. Policy aims that are the motive for any group in war should also be the foremost determinants of its conduct. The single most important thought to understand about our theory is that war must serve policy. As policy aims of war may vary from resistance against aggression to an unconditional surrender of the enemy government, it should also have the application of violence vary in accordance with those aims. Of course, we may also have to adjust our policy objectives to accommodate 
our chosen means. These means that we must trust not establish goals outside of our capabilities. It is important to recognize that many political aims cannot be solved by military means. Some can, but rarely, as anticipated. War tends to take its own course as it unfolds. We should recognize that war is not an inanimate instrument, but an animate force which may likely have unintended consequences that may change the political situation. To say that war is an extension of politics and policy is not to say that war is strictly political phenomenon. It also contains social, cultural, psychological, and other elements. These also exert a strong influence on the conduct of war, as well as one's war's usefulness for solving political problems. When the policy motive of war is extreme, such as the destruction of an enemy government, then war's natural military tendency towards destruction will coincide with the political aim. There will tend to be few political restrictions on the military conduct of war. On the other hand, the more limited the policy motive, the more the military tendency towards destruction may be in the variance with the motive or motif, and the more likely the political considerations will restrict the application of military force. Commanders must recognize that since military action must serve policy, these political restrictions on military action may be perfectly correct. At the same time, Military leaders have a responsibility to advise the political leadership when the limitations imposed on the military action jeopardize the military's ability to accomplish its assigned mission. There are two ways to use military force to impose our will on the enemy. The first is to make the enemy helpless to resist us by physically destroying his military capabilities. The aim is the elimination, permanent or temporary, of the enemy's military power. It has historically been called a strategy of annihilation, although it does not necessarily require the physical annihilation of all military forces. Instead, it requires the enemy's incapacitation as a viable military threat and thus can also be called the strategy of incapacitation. We use force in this way, when we seek an unlimited political objective, such as to overthrow an enemy leadership. We may also use this strategy in pursuit of more limited political objectives. And we believe the enemy will continue to resist us as long as any means to do so remain. The second approach is to convince the enemy that accepting our terms will be less painful than continuing to resist. This is a strategy of erosion, using military force to erode the enemy's leadership's will. In such a strategy, we use military force to raise the costs of resistance to make it higher for the enemy, to raise the price they're willing to pay. We use force in this manner to, in pursuit of limited political goals that we believe the enemy leadership will ultimately be willing to accept. Means in war. At the highest level, war involves the use of all elements of power, and one political group can bring bear against another. These include, for example, economic, political, political, diplomatic, and military, and other psychological forces. Our primary concern is with the use of military force. Nevertheless, while we focus on the use of military force, we must not consider it as an isolation from the other elements of national power. The use of military force may take any number of forms where the mere deployment of forces as a demonstration of resolve to the enforcement of the negotiated truce to the general warfare with sophisticated weaponry. The spectrum of conflict. Conflict can take a wide range of forms, constituting a spectrum which reflects the magnitude of violence involved. At one end, the, one end of the spectrum 
are those actions referred to as military operations other than war, in which the application of military power is usually restrained to a selective military operations other than war encompass the use of a broad range of military capabilities to deter war, resolve conflict, promote peace, and support civil authorities. At one end of the spectrum is general war, a large-scale sustained combat operation such as global conflict between major powers, where on the spectrum to place the particular conflict depends on several factors. Among them are policy objectives, available military means, national will, and density of fighting forces or combat power on the battlefield. In general, the greater this density, the more intense the conflict. Each conflict is not uniformly intense. As a result, we may witness relatively intense actions within the military operation other than war or relatively quiet sectors or phases in the major regional conflict or general war. Military operations other than war and small wars are more probable than a major regional conflict or general war. Many political groups simply do not possess the military means to wage a war at the high end of the spectrum. And many who fight a technologically or numerically superior enemy may choose to fight in a way that does not justify the enemy's full use of that superiority unless actual survival is at stake. Political groups are generally unwilling to accept risks associated with general war. However, a conflict's intensity may change over time. Belligerence may escalate the level of violence of the original means if the original means do not achieve the desired results. Similarly, Wars may actually de-escalate over time. For example, after an initial pulse of intense violence, the belligerents may continue to fight on a lesser level, unable to sustain the initial level of intensity. The Marine Corps, as the nation's force in readiness, must have versatility and flexibility to deal with the situation at any greater challenge than it may appear. Military operations other than small wars are not simply lesser forms of general war. A modern military force capable of waging a war against a large conventional force may find itself ill-prepared for small war against a highly equipped guerrilla force. There are levels of war. Activities in war take place at several interrelated levels, which form a hierarchy. These levels are strategic, operational, and tactical. The highest level is strategic. Activities at the strategic level focus directly on policy objectives. Strate strategy applies to peace as well as war. We distinguish between national strategy, which coordinates focuses on the elements of national power to attain policy objectives and military strategy, which is the application of military force to serve the policy objectives. Military strategy thus is subordinate to national strategy. Military strategy can be thought of as the art of winning wars and securing peace. Strategy involves established goals, assigning forces, providing assets, and imposing conditions on the use of force in theaters of war. Strategy derived from political and policy objectives must be clearly understood to be the sole authoritative basis for all operations. At the lowest level is the tactical level. Tactics refer to the concepts and methods used to accomplish a particular mission. In either combatant or military operations in war, tactics focuses on the application of combat power to defeat the enemy force in combat in particular time and place. In non-combat situations, tactics may include uh, schemes and other methods which we perform other missions. 
such as enforcing order and maintaining security during peacekeeping operations. We normally think of ta tactics in terms of combat, and in this context, tactics can't be thought of as the art and science of winning engagements and battles. It includes the use of firepower and maneuver, the integration of different arms, and the immediate exploitation of success to the defeated enemy. Included within the tactical level of war is the performance of combat service support functions such as resupply and maintenance. Tactical level also includes technical application of combat power, which consists of those techniques and procedures for accomplishing specific tasks within tactical application. These include the call for fire, techniques of fire, the operation of weapons and equipment, the tactical movement techniques. There is a certain overlap between tactics and techniques, and we make a point only to draw the distinction between tactics, which requires judgment and creativity, and techniques and procedures, which generally involves repetitive routine. The operational level of war links the strategic and tactical levels. It is the use of tactical results to attain a strategic objectives. The, ta the operational level includes deciding when, where, and under what conditions to engage the enemy in the battlefield, and when, where, and under what conditions to refuse battle in support of higher aims. Actions at this level imply broader dimension of time and space than actions at the tactical level. As strategy deals with winning wars and tactics with winning battles and engagements, the operational level of war is the art and science of winning campaigns. It means our tactical results and its ends are the established strategic objectives. The distinctions between levels of war are rarely clearly de delineated in practice, but they are, to some extent, only a matter of scope and scale. Usually, there is some amount of overlap, and a single commander may have responsibilities at more than one level. As shown in Figure 1, the overlap may be slight, and this will likely be the case in the large-scale conventional conflicts during large military formations and multiple theaters. In such cases... There is a fairly distinct strategic, operational, and tactical domains, and most commanders will find them find their activities focused at one level or another. However, in other cases, the levels of war may compress so that there is significant overlap, as shown in Figure Two, especially in either nuclear war or a military operation other than war. A single commander may operate at two or even three levels simultaneously. In a nuclear war, strategic decisions about the direction of war and tactical decisions about the employment of weapons are essentially uh, one and the same. In a military operation other than war, even small unit leader, for example, may find that tactical actions have strategic implications. Initiative and response. All actions in war, regardless of the level, are based on either taking the initiative or reacting in response to an opponent. By taking the initiative, we dictate the terms of the conflict and the force the enemy to meet us on our terms. The initiative allows us to pursue some positive aim, even if only to preempt an enemy initiative. It is through the initiative that we seek to impose our will on the enemy. The initiative is clearly the preferred form of action because only through initiative can we ultimately impose our will on the enemy. At least one party to a conflict must take the initiative for without the desire to impose upon the other, there would be no conflict. The second party to the conflict must respond, for without the desire to resist, there again would be no conflict. If we cannot take the initiative, and the enemy does, we are compelled to respond in order to counteract the enemy's attempts. 
The response generally has a negative aim, that of negating, blocking, or counterattacking. The enemy's intentions, like a counterpunch in boxing, the response often has its ob- object seized an initiative from the opponent. The flux of war is the product of the continuous interaction between initiative and response. We can imagine that a conflict in which both belligerents try to take the initiative simultaneously as meeting engagement. For example, after one initial class, one of them will gain the upper hand, and the other will be compelled to respond, at least until they are able to wrestle the initiative away from one another. Actions in war, are more or less reflect constant imperative to seize and maintain initiative. This discussion leads to a related pair of concepts, the offense and the defense. The offense contributes to striking power. We normally associate the offense with initiative. The most obvious way to seize and maintain initiative is to strike first and keep striking. The defense, on the other hand, contributes resisting power, the ability to preserve and protect ourselves. The defense generally has a negative aim, that of resisting the enemy's will. The defense tends to be more efficient form of warfare, meaning that it tends to expend less energy, which is not the same as saying that the defense is inherently the stronger form of warfare, The relative advantages and disadvantages of offense and defense are situationally dependent because we typically think of the defense as waiting for the enemy to strike. We often associate with the defense as response rather than initiative. This is not necessarily true. We do not necessarily assume the defensive only out of weakness. For example, the defensive may counter the interact, the initiative of the enemy if it is compelled to attack into the strength of our defense. Under such conditions, we may have the positive aim of destroying the enemy. Similarly, a defender waiting in ambush may have the initiative if the enemy can brought, be brought into a trap. The defense may be another way of striking at the enemy. While opposing forms, the offense and defense are mutually exclusive. In fact, they cannot exist separately. For example, the defense cannot be purely passive resistance. An active defense must assume an offense, an offensive character, striking at the moment of the enemy's greatest vulnerability. As Clausewitz wrote, the defense is not a simple shield, but a shield made up of well-directed blows. The truly decisive element of the defense is the counterattack. Thus, the offense is an integral of component of the concept of the defense. Similarly, the defense is an essential component of the offense. The offense cannot sustain itself indefinitely. At some times and places, it becomes necessary to halt the offense to replenish, and the defense automatically takes over. Furthermore, the requirement to concentrate forces for the offense often necessitates assuming the defensive elsewhere. Therefore, out of necessity, we must include defensive considerations as part of our concept of the offense. This brings us to the concept of culminating point, without which our understanding of the relationship between the offense and the defense would be incomplete. Not only the offense not sustain itself indefinitely, but also it generally grows weaker as it advances. Certain moral factors such as morale or boldness may increase with successful attack, but these often cannot compensate for the physical losses involved in sustaining an advance in the face of resistance. We advance at a cost in lives, fuel, ammunition, and physical and sometimes moral strength 
and so the attack becomes weaker over time. Enemy resistance, of course, is the major factor in the disposition of strength. Eventually, we reach the culmination point at which we can no longer sustain the attack and must revert to the defense. It is precisely that point that the defensive element of the offense is the most vulnerable to, to the offensive element of the defense, the counterattack. We conclude that there exists no clear division between the offense and the defense. Our theory of war should not accept to impose one artificially. The offense and the defense exist simultaneously as necessary components of each other and transition from one to the other is fluid and continuous. These relationships between initiative and response, offense and defense, exist simultaneously at the various levels of war. We may seize the initiative locally as part of a larger response. In the limited counterattack, for example, likewise, we may employ a tactical defense as part of our offensive campaign, availing ourselves the advantages of the defense tactically while pursuing the operational offensive aim. Styles of warfare. Styles in warfare can be described by their place on the spectrum of the attrition and maneuver. Warfare by attrition pursues victory through the cumulative destruction of the enemy's material assets by superior firepower. It is a direct approach to the conduct of war that sees war as a straightforward test of strength and a matter of principality of force ratios. An enemy is seen as the collection of targets to be engaged and destroyed systematically. The enemy concentrations are sought out as the wor most worthwhile targets. The logical conclusions of attrition warfare is the eventual physical destruction of the enemy's entire arsenal, although the expectation is that the enemy will surrender or disengage before this happens out of unwillingness to bear the resisting costs. The focus is on the efficient application of fires, leading to highly proceduralized approach to war. Technically, proficiency, especially in the weapons, employment, matters more than cunning or creative. Attrition warfare may recognize maneuver as an important component, but sees its purpose as merely to allow us to bring our fires more effectively to bear on the enemy. The attritionist tends to gauge progress in quantitative terms, battle damage assessments, body counts, and terrain captured. Results are generally proportionate to efforts, greater expenditure, net greater results, that is, greater attrition. The desire for volume and accuracy of fire tends to lend toward centralized control, just as emphasis on efficiency tends to lend to an inward focus on procedures and techniques. Success depends on an overall superiority in the attritional capacity, that is, the ability to inflict and absorb attrition. The greatest necessity for success is numerical and material superiority. At the national level, war becomes much more an industrial as a military problem. Historically, nations and militaries that perceived that they were numerically and technologically superior have often adopted warfare by attrition. Pure attrition warfare does not exist in practice, but examples of warfare with high attrition content are plentiful. The operations 
of both sides of the Western Front of the First World War, the French defensive tactics and operations against the Germans in May 1940, the Allied campaigns in Italy in 1943 to 1944, and Eisenhower's broad front offensive in Europe and Normandy in 1944, U.S. operations in Korea after 1950, and most U.S. operations in Vietnam. The opposite end of the spectrum is warfare by maneuver which stems from a desire to circumvent a problem and attack from its position of advantage rather than meet it straight on. Rather than pursuing a cumulative destruction of every component in the enemy arsenal, the goal is to attack the enemy system, to incapacitate the enemy systematically. Enemy components may retain untouched but cannot function as parts of the cohesive whole. Rather than being viewed as desirable targets, enemy concentrations are generally avoided as enemy strengths. Instead of attacking the enemy strength, the goal is the anticipation of our strength against a selected enemy. Weakness in order to maximize advantage. The tactic requires the ability to identify and exploit such weaknesses. Success depends not, not so much on the efficient performance of procedures and techniques, but on understanding the specific characteristics of the enemy system. Maneuver relies on speed and surprise, for without either, we cannot concentrate strength against the enemy weakness. Tempo is itself a weapon, often most important. Success is success by maneuver, unlike attrition, is often disproportionate to the effort made. However, for example, the same reasons maneuver incompletely applied carries with it a greater chance of catastrophic failure. With attrition, potential losses tend to be proportionate to risks incurred. Firepower and attrition are essentially elements of warfare by maneuver. In fact, at the critical point where strength has been focused against the enemy vulnerability, attrition may be extreme and may involve outright annihilation of the enemy elements. Nonetheless, the object of such local attrition is not merely to contribute incrementally to the overall wearing down of the entire enemy force, but to eliminate key element which incapacitates the enemy systematically. Like attrition warfare, maneuver warfare does not exist it's theoretically, in its theoretically pure form. Like attrition warfare... Maneuver warfare does not exist in its theoretically pure form. Examples of warfare with high enough maneuver content that they can be considered maneuver warfare include uh, Albany's decisive campaign against the Turks in Palestine in 1918, the German Blitzkrieg operations of 1939 to 1941, and notably the invasion of France in 1940. The failed Allied landing at Enzino in 1944, which was an effort to avoid the attrition battles of the Italian theater. Patton's breakout from Normandy Beachhead in the late 1944 and MacArthur's Inchon campaign in 1950 and the 3rd Marine Amphibious Force combined action program in Vietnam, which attacked the Viet Cong by eliminating their essential popular support base through the pacification of rural villages. All warfare involves both maneuver and attrition in some mix. The predominant style depends on the variety of factors, not least of which are our own capabilities and the nature of the enemy. Marine Corps doctrine today is based principally on warfare by maneuver, as we will see in the fourth chapter, Conduct of War. Combat power. Combat power is a total destructive force that we bring to bear on the enemy at any given time. Some factors in combat power are quite tangible and easily measured, such as superior numbers, which clause which called the most common element in victory. Some may be less easily measured, 
such as effects of maneuver, tempo, or surprise. The advantages conferred by geography or climate, the relative strengths of the offense and defense, or the relative merits of striking the enemy in the front, flanks, or rear. Some may be wholly intangible, such as morale, fighting spirit, perseverance, or the effects of leadership. It is not our intent to try to list or categorize all the various components of combat power, to index their relative values, or to describe their combinations in variations. Each combination is unique and temporary, nor is it even desirable to be able to do so. Since this would lead us to a formulaic approach to war, our intent is merely to speed and focus. Of all the consistent patterns we can discern in war, there are two concepts of universal significance in generating combat power, speed and focus. Speed is the rapidity of action. It applies to both time and space. Speed over time is tempo, the constant ability to operate quickly. Speed over distance or space is the ability to move rapidly. Both forms are genuine sources of combat power. In other words, speed is a weapon. In war, it is relative speed that matters rather than absolute speed. Superior speed allows us to seize the initiative and dictate the terms of action, forcing the enemy to react to us. Speed provides security. It is a prerequisite for maneuver and surprise. Moreover, speed is, n is necessary in order to concentrate superior strength at the decisive time and place. Since it is relative speed that matters, it follows that we should take all measures to improve our own speed while degrading our enemies. However, experience shows that we cannot sustain a high rate of speed indefinitely. As a result, a pattern develops. Fast, slow, fast again. A competitive rhythm develops in combat, with each belligerent trying to generate speed when it is advantageous. Focus is the convergence of effects in time and space on some objective. It is the generation of superior combat power at a particular time and place. Focus may achieve decisive logical superiority for a numerical or inferior force. The willingness to focus at the decisive place and time necessitates strict economy and acceptance of risk elsewhere and other times. To devote means to unnecessary efforts or exercise means to necessary secondary efforts violates the principle of focus and is counterproductive to the true objective. Focus applies not only to the conduct of war, but also to the preparation of war. Since war is fluid and opportunities are fleeting, focus applies to time as well as space. We must focus effects not only on the decisive location, but also uh, at the decisive moment. We achieve focus through cooperation towards accomplishment of a common purpose. This applies to all elements of force. It involves the coordination of ground combat, aviation, and combat service support elements. The combination of speed and focus aids punch or shock effect to our actions. It follows that we should strike with the greatest possible combination of speed and focus. Surprise and boldness. Two additional concepts are particularly useful in generating combat power. Surprise and boldness. By surprise, we mean a state of disorientation resulting from an unexpected event that degrades the enemy's ability to resist. We achieve surprise by striking the enemy at a time or place or in a manner in which the enemy is unprepared. It is not essential that we take the enemy unaware, but that we unawareness came too late to react effectively. The desire for surprise is more or less basic to all operations, for without its superiority at a decisive point is hardly conceivable. While a, necessi while 
A necessary precaution of superiority, surprise is also a genuine source of combat power in its own right because of the psychological effect. Surprise can decisively affect the outcome of combat far beyond the physical means at hand. The advantage gained by surprise depends on the degree of disorientation and the enemy's ability to adjust and recover. Surprise, if sufficiently harsh, can lead to shock. The total, if temporary, inability to react. Surprise is based on speed, stealth, ambiguity, and deception. It often means doing the more difficult thing, taking a securious direction of attack. For example, in hope that the enemy will not expect it. In fact, this is the genesis of maneuver, to circumvent the enemy's strength and to strike at weakness. While the element of surprise is often a decisive importance, we must realize that it is difficult to achieve, ease, to lose. Its advantages are only temporary and must quickly be exploited. Friction, a dominant attribute of war, is the constant enemy of surprise. We must also recognize that while surprise is not desirable, the ability to achieve it does not depend solely on our own effort. Surprise does not depend on what we do. It is the enemy's reaction to what we do that depends at least as much on the enemy's susceptibility to surprise, his expectations and preparedness. Our ability to achieve surprise thus rests on our ability to appreciate and then exploit our enemy's expectations. Therefore, while surprise can't be decisive, it is risky to depend on it alone for the margin of victory. There are three basic ways to go about achieving surprise. First is through deception, to convince the enemy that we're going to do something other than what we're really going to do in order to induce him to act in a manner prejudicial to his own interests. The intent is to give the enemy a clear picture of the situation, but a wrong picture. The second way is through ambiguity. To act in such a way that the enemy does not know what to expect. Because he does not know what to expect, he must prepare for numerous possibilities that he cannot prepare adequately for any specific one. The third is through stealth. To deny the enemy any knowledge of an impending action. The enemy is not deceived or confused as to our intentions, but is completely ignorant of them. Of the three, deception generally offers the greatest effects, but is the most difficult to achieve. Boldness is a source of combat power, in as much as the same way as surprise is. Boldness is a characteristic of unhesitatingly exploiting the natural uncertainty of war to pursue major results rather than marginal ones. According to Clausewitz, boldness must be guaranteed a certain power over and above successful calculations involving space-time and a magnitude of forces for whatever it is superior it will take advantage of its opponent's weakness. In other words, it is genuinely creative force. Boldness is superior to timidity in every instance, although boldness does not always equate to immediate aggressive action. A nervy, calculating patience that allows the enemy to commit itself irrevocably before we strike him can also be a form of boldness. Boldness is based on a strong situational awareness. We weigh the situation, then act. In other words, boldness must be tempered with judgment, lest it border on recklessness. There is a close connection between the surprise and boldness. The willingness to accept risks often necessary to achieve surprise reflects boldness. Likewise, boldness contributes to achieving surprise. After we weigh the situation, we take half of the measures diminishes the effects of surprise. Regardless, there is a close connection between surprise and boldness. 
the willingness to accept risks, often necessary to achieve surprise, reflects boldness. Likewise, boldness contributes to achieving surprise. After we weigh the situation, to take half measures diminishes the effects of surprise. Centers of Gravity and Critical Vulnerabilities It is not enough to simply generate superior combat power. We can easily conceive of superior combat power dissipated on several unrelated efforts or concentrated on some inconsequential object. To win, we must focus combat power towards a decisive aim. There are two related concepts that help us to think about this. Centers of gravity and critical vulnerabilities. Each belligerent is not a unitary force, but a complex system consisting of numerous physical, moral, and mental components, as well as relationships among them. The combination of these factors determines each belligerent's unique character. Some of these factors are more important than others. Some may contribute only marginally to the belligerent's power. Their loss would not cause significant damage. Others may fundamentally resource of capabilities, which we ask ourselves, which factors are critical to the enemy? Which can the enemy not do without? Which, if eliminated, will bend him almost quickly to our will? These are centers of gravity. Depending on the situation, centers of gravity may be intangible characteristics, such as resolve or morale. They may be capabilities such as armored forces or aviation strength. They may be localities such as a critical piece of terrain that anchors an entire defensive system. They may be the relationship between two or more components of a system such as the cooperation between the two arms, the relations in the alliance, or the conjunction of two forces. In short, centers of gravity are important sources of strength. If they are not friendly centers of gravity, we want to protect them. And if they are enemy centers of gravity, we want to take them away. We want to attack the source of enemy strength. But we do not want to attack directly into that strength. We obviously stand a better chance of success by concentrating our strength against some relative enemy weakness. So... We also ask ourselves, where is the enemy vulnerable? In battlefield terms, this means that we should generally avoid his front, where his attention is focused and he is strongest, and to seek out his flanks and rear, where he does not expect us, and where we can also cause the greatest psychological damage. We should also strike him in a moment in time when he is vulnerable, of all the vulnerabilities we might choose to exploit, some are more critical to the enemy than others. Some may contribute significantly to the enemy's downfall, while others may lead only to minimal gains. Therefore, we should focus our efforts against critical vulnerability, a vulnerability that, if exploited, will do the most significant damage to the enemy's ability to resist us. We should try to understand the enemy system in terms of a relatively few centers of gravity or critical vulnerabilities. Because this allows us to focus our own efforts. The more we can narrow it down, the more we can easily focus. However, we should recognize that most enemy systems will not have a single center of gravity on which everything else depends. Or if they do, the center of gravity will be well protected. It will often be necessary to attack several lesser centers of gravity or critical vulnerabilities simultaneously or in, on an ensemble to have a desired effect. Center of gravity and critical vulnerabilities are complementary concepts. The former looks at the problem of how to attack the enemy system from the perspective of seeking the source of strength, the latter from the perspective of seeking weakness. The critical vulnerability is a pathway to attacking center of gravity. 
both have a same underlying purpose to target our actions in such a way as to have the greatest effect on the enemy. Creating and Exploiting Opportunity This discussion leads us to a corollary thought. The importance of creating and exploiting opportunity. In all cases, the commander must be prepared to react to the unexpected and exploit opportunities created by conditions which develop from the initial action. When identification of the enemy critical vulnerabilities is particularly difficult, the commander may have no choice but to exploit any and all vulnerabilities until action uncovers the decisive opportunity. As the opposing wills interact, they create various fleeting opportunities for either foe. Such opportunities are often born in the fog and friction, and that is natural in war. They may be the result of our own actions, enemy mistakes, or even chance. By exploiting, exploiting opportunities, we create in increasing numbers more opportunities for exploitation. It is often the ability and the willingness to ruthlessly exploit these opportunities that generate decisive results. The ability to take advantage of an opportunity is a function of speed, flexibility, boldness, and initiative. Conclusion. The theory of war that we have described provides the foundation of the discussions of the conduct of war in the final chapter. All acts of war are political acts, and so on the conduct of war must be made to support the aims of policy. War takes place at several levels simultaneously, from the strategic direction of the overall war effort to the tactical application of combat power in battle. At the highest level, war involves the use of all the elements of political power, of which military force is just one. Action in war at all levels is the result of interplay between initiative and response, with the object being to seize and maintain the initiative. All warfare is based on concepts such as speed, focus, surprise, and boldness. Success in war depends on the ability to direct our efforts against critical vulnerabilities or centers of gravity and to recognize and exploit fleeting opportunities as we will discuss the war fighting doctrine we derive from the theory is one based on maneuver chapter three preparing for war one essential thing is action action has three stages Decision is born of thought, in order for preparation and execution, and the execution itself. All three stages are governed by the will. The will is rooted in character, and for the man of action, character is more critical importance than intellect. Intellect without will is worthless. Will without intellect is dangerous. Hans von Schlicht. It is not enough that the troops be skilled infantrymen or artillerymen of high morale. They must be skilled watermen and junglemen who know it and can be done marines with marine training. Earl H. Ellis During times of peace, the most important task of any military is to prepare for war. Through its preparedness, a military provides deterrence against potential aggressors. As the nation's expeditionary force in readiness, the Marine Corps must maintain itself for immediate employment in any clime and place, and in any type of conflict. All peacetime activities should focus on achieving combat readiness. This applies a high level of training, flexibility in organization and equipment, professional leadership, and the cohesive doctrine. Force planning. Force planning is planning that is associated with the creation and maintenance of military capabilities. Planning plays an important role in the preparation for war as it does in the conduct of war. The key to any plan is to clearly define an objective. In this case, 
a required level of readiness. The Marine Corps force planning is concept-based. That is, all force planning derives from a common set of concepts which describe how Marine Corps forces will operate and perform certain key functions. These concepts describe the types of missions Marine forces are likely to be required to perform or how they might accomplish those missions. These concepts provide the basis for identifying required capabilities and implementing coordinated programs to development of those capabilities. Based on this common set of concepts, force planning integrates all the efforts of peacetime Marine Corps, including training, education, doctrine, organization, personal in management, and equipment acquisition. Unity of effort is an important during preparation of war as it is during the conduct of war. The systematic process of identifying the objective and planning a course to obtain it applies to all levels of preparedness. Organization. The operating forces must be organized to provide forward deployed or rapidly deployable forces capable of conducting expeditionary operations in any environment. This means that in addition to maintaining their own unique amphibious capability, the operating forces must maintain a capability to, to deploy by whatever means is appropriate to the situation. The active operating forces must be capable of responding immediately to most types of crisis and conflict. Many sustained missions will require augmentation of the reserve establishment. For operations and training, Marine forces will be formed into Marine Air Ground Task Forces or MEGTAFs. MEGTAFs are task organizations consisting of ground aviation and combat service support and command elements. They have no standard structure, but rather are constituted as appropriate for a specific situation. A MEGTAF provides a single commander, a combined arms force, that can be tailored to the situation faced. As the situation changes, it may, of course, be necessary to restructure the MEGTAF. Operating forces should be organized for warfighting and then adapted for peacetime rather than vice versa. Tables of organization f should reflect two central requirements of deployability and the ability to task organize according to specific situations. Units should also be organized according to the type only to the extent dictated by training, administrative, and logistic requirements. Commanders should establish habitual relationship between supported and supporting units to develop operational familiarity among those units. This does not preclude non-standard relationships when required by the situation. Doctrine. Doctrine is the teaching of the fundamental beliefs of the Marine Corps on the subject of war, from its nature and theory to its Preparation and conduct. Doctrine establishes a particular way of thinking about war and the way of fighting. It also provides a philosophy for leading Marines in combat, a mandate for professionalism, a common language. In short, it establishes a way we practice our profession. In this manner, doctrine provides the basis for harmonious action and mutual understanding. Marine Corps doctrine is made official by the Commandant and is an established in this publication. Marine Corps doctrine demands professional competence among its leaders. As military professionals charged with the defense of the nation, Marine leaders must be true experts in the conduct of war. They must be individuals, both of action and of intellect, skilled at getting things done, while at the same time, conversant in the military art, resolute and self-reliant in their decisions. They must also be energetic and insistent in execution. The military profession is a thinking profession. Every Marine is expected to be a student in the art and science of war.
Officers especially are expected to have a solid foundation of military theory and knowledge of military history and timeless lessons to be gained from it. Leaders must have a strong sense of great responsibility of their office. The resources that they will expend in war are human lives. The Marine Corps style of warfare requires intelligent leaders with a penchant for boldness and initiative down to the lowest levels. Boldness is an essential moral trait in a leader for it generates combat power beyond the physical means at hand. Initiative and willingness to act on one's own judgment, a prerequisite for boldness. These traits carried to excess can lead to rashness. But we must realize that errors by junior leaders stemming from overboldness are a necessary part of learning. We should also deal with such errors leniently. There must be no zero defects mentality. Abolishing zero defects means that we do not stifle boldness or initiative through the threat of punishment. It does not mean that the commanders do not counsel subordinates on mistakes or constructive criticism in an important element in learning, nor does it give subordinates free license to act stupidly or recklessly. Not only must we not stifle boldness or initiative, we must continue to encourage both traits in spite of mistakes. On the other hand, we should deal severely with errors of inaction or timidity. We will not accept the lack of orders as a justification for inaction. It is each Marine's duty to take initiative as the situation demands. We must not tolerate the avoidance of responsibility or necessary risk. Consequently, trust is an essential trait among leaders. Trust by seniors is the abilities of their subordinates and by the juniors is the competence and the support for their seniors. Trust must be earned and actions which undermine trust must be met with strict censure. Trust is a product of confidence and familiarity. Confidence among comrades results in demonstrated professional skill. Familiarity results in shared experience in common professional philosophy. Relations among leaders, from the corporal to the general, should be based on honesty and frankness, regardless of the disparity between grades. Until a commander has reached the stated decision, subordinates should consider it their duty to provide honest professional opinions, even though these may be in disagreement with the seniors' opinions. However, once the decision has been reached, Juniors may juniors must support it as if it were their own. Seniors must encourage candor among subordinates and must not hide behind their grade insignia. Ready compliance for the purpose of their personal advancement, the behavior of yesmen will not be tolerated. Training. The purpose of all training is to develop forces that can win in combat. Training is key to combat effectiveness and therefore is the main effort in peacetime military. However, training should not stop with the commencement of war. Training must continue during war to adapt to the lessons of combat. All officers and enlisted Marines undergo a similar entry-level training, which is, in effect, a socialization process. This training provides all Marines a common experience, a proud heritage, a set of values, a common bond of camaraderie. In this essential first step is the making of a Marine. The basic individual skills are an essential foundation of the combative effectiveness that must receive 
a heavy emphasis. All Marines, regardless of their occupational specialty, must be trained in the basics of combat skills. At the same time, unit skills are extremely important. They are not simply an accumulation of individual skills. Adequacy in individual skills does not automatically mean unit skills are satisfactory. Commanders at each echelon must allot subordinates sufficient time and freedom to conduct the training necessary to achieve the proficiency at their own levels. They must ensure that higher level demands do not deny subordinates adequate opportunities for autonomous unit training. In order to develop initiative among junior leaders, the conduct of training, like combat, should be decentralized. Senior commanders influence training by establishing goals and standards, communicating the intent of the training and the establishment of the main effort for training. As a rule, they should refrain from dictating how the training should be accomplished. Training programs should reflect practical, challenging, and progressive goals, beginning with individual and small unit skills and culminating in a fully combined arms or MAGTAF. In general, the organization for combat should also be the organization's for training. That is, units including MAGTAFs should train with the full complement of the assigned reinforcing and supporting forces they are required in combat. Collective training consists of drills and exercises. Drills are forms of small unit training, which stress proficiency and progressive repetition of tasks. Drills are an effective method for developing standardized techniques and procedures that must be performed repetitively without a variation to ensure speed and coordination. Examples are gun drills, pre-flight preparations, and immediate actions. In contrast, exercises are designed to train units and individuals in tactics under simulated combat conditions. Exercises should approximate the conditions of war in as much as possible. That is, they should induce friction from the form of uncertainty, stress, disorder, and opposing wills. This last characteristic is the most important. Only in opposed free play exercises can we practice the art of war. Dictated or canned scenarios eliminate the element of independent opposing wills that is the essence of war. Critiques are an important part of the training because a critical self-analysis, even after success, is essential to improvement. The, their purpose is to draw out the lessons of training. As a result, we should conduct critiques. As a result, we should conduct critiques immediately after completing training before memory of the events has faded. Critiques should be held in an atmosphere of open and frank dialogue in which all hands are encouraged to contribute. We, as we learn much from mistakes as from the things we've done, so we must be willing to admit mistakes and discuss them. Of course, sub a subordinate's willingness to admit mistakes depends on the commander's willingness to tolerate them. Because we recognize that no two situations in war are the same, our critique should focus not so much on the actions we took as to why we took those actions and why they brought the results that they did. Military Professional Education Professional military education is designed to develop creative thinking leaders. From its initial stages of leadership, training, a leader career should be viewed as continuous. Professional military education is designed to develop creative thinking leaders. From initial stages of leadership, Training, a leader's career, should be viewed as a continuous progressive process of development. At each stage, a Marine should be preparing for the subsequent stage. The early stages of a leader's career are, in effect, an apprenticeship, while receiving a foundation in theory and concepts that will serve them throughout their careers, leaders focus on understanding requirements 
and learning and applying the procedures and techniques associated with a particular field. This is when they learn their trades as aviators, infantrymen, artillerymen, or logisticians. As they progress, leaders should strive to master their respective fields and understand the interrelationship of the techniques and procedures within the field. A Marine's goal at the stage is to become an expert at the tactical level of war. As an officer continues to develop mastery, should encompass a broad range of subjects and should extend to the operational level of war. At this stage, an officer should not only be an expert in tactics and techniques, but should also understand combined arms continuous warfare, and expeditionary operations. At the senior levels, an officer should be fully capable of articulating, applying, and integrating MEGTAF, warfighting capabilities to a joint and multinational environment, and should be an expert in the art of all war at all levels. The responsibility for implementing professional military education in the Marine Corps is a three-tiered. It resides not only with the educational establishment, but also with the commander and the individual. The education establishment consists of those schools administered by the Marine Corps, the subordinate commands or outside agencies established to provide formal education in the art and science of war. All professional schools, particularly officer schools, should focus on developing a talent for military judgment, not on imparting knowledge through rote learning. Study conducted in the education establishment can neither provide complete career preparation for an individual nor reach all individuals. Rather, it builds upon like a base provided by commanders and the individual study. All commanders should be considered for professional development of their subordinates a per principal responsibility of command. Commanders should foster a personal teacher-student relationship with their subordinates. Commanders are expected to conduct a continuing professional education program for their subordinates that includes developing military judgment and decision making and teaches general professional subjects and specific technical subjects pertinent to occupational specialties. Useful tools for general professional development include supervised reading programs, map, map exercises, war games, battle studies, and terrain studies. Commanders should see the development of their subordinates as a direct reflection on themselves. Finally, every Marine has an individual responsibility to study the profession of arms. A leader without either interest in or knowledge of the history and theory of warfare in intellectual context of the military profession is a leader in appearance only. Self-directed study in the art and science of war is at least equal in importance to maintaining physical condition as should receive at least equal time. This is particularly true among officers. After all, the mind is an officer's principal weapon. Personnel Management Since war is a base of human enterprise. Effective personnel management is important to success. This is especially true for the doctrine of maneuver warfare, which places a premium on individual judgment and action. We should recognize that all Marines of a given grade and occupational specialty are not interchangeable and should not assign people to billets based on a specific ability and temperament. This includes recognizing those who are best suited for commanding assignments and those who are best suited for staff assignments without personalizing one or the other by so recognizing. The personnel management system should seek to achieve personal sustainability and stability within the units and staffs as a means of fostering cohesion, teamwork, and implicit understanding. We 
recognize that casualties in war will take a toll on personal stability. But the greater the stability a unit has initially, the better it will absorb those casualties and incorporate replacements. Finally, promotion and advancement policy should reward the willingness to accept responsibility and exercise initiative. Further, equipment should be designed so that its use is consistent with established doctrine and tactics. A primary consideration of strategic and tactical lift, the Marine Corps' reliance on shipping for strategic mobility and on landing craft, helicopters and vertical short takeoff and landing aircraft for tactical mobility. From ship to shore and during operations ashore. Another key consideration is the employability and supportability of underdeveloped, underdeveloped theaters in the limited supporting infrastructure where the Marine Corps units can frequently expect to operate. In order to minimize research and development costs and fielding time, the Marine Corps will exploit existing capabilities of off-the-shelf technology to the greatest extent possible. Acquisition should be complementary to a process based on established operating functional concepts, especially for the long term. The process must identify combat requirements and develop equipment to satisfy these requirements. Where possible, we should base these requirements on an analysis of likely enemy vulnerabilities and should develop equipment to exploit those vulnerabilities. At the same time, the process should not overlook existing equipment of the obvious usefulness. Equipment is useful only if it increases combat effectiveness. Any piece of equipment requires support, operator training, maintenance, power sources, or fuel and transportation. The anticipated enhancement of capabilities must justify the support requirements and the employment of the equipment must take these requirements into account. The acquisition effort should balance the need for specialization with the need for utility in a broad range of environments. Increasing the capabilities of the equipment generally requires developing increasing specialized equipment. Increasing specialized equipment trends to increasing vulnerability to countermeasures. One solution to this problem is not to develop a single family of equipment, to, but to maintain a variety of equipment types. As much as possible, employment techniques and procedures should be developed concurrently with equipment to minimize delays between fielding of the equipment and its usefulness to the operating forces. For the same reason, initial operator training should also precede field equipment training. There are two dangers with respect to equipment. The over-reliance on technology and the failure to make the most out of technological capabilities. Technology can enhance the ways and means of war by improving the humanity's ability to wage it. But technology cannot and should not attempt to eliminate humanity from the process of waging war. Better equipment is not the cure for all ills. Doctrinal and tactical solutions to combat deficiencies must also be sought. Any advantages gained by technological advancement are only temporary for someone will always find the countermeasure, tactical or itself technological, which will lessen the impact of the technology. Additionally, we must not become so dependent on equipment that we can no longer function effectively when the equipment becomes inoperable. Finally, we must exercise discipline in the use of technology. Advanced information technology is especially can tempt us to try to maintain precise positive control over the subordinates, which is incompatible with the Marine Corps philosophy of command. Conclusion There are two basic military functions, waging war and preparing for war. Any military activities that do not contribute to the conduct of the present war are justifiable only if they contribute to the preparedness for the possible future one, clearly, we cannot afford to separate the conduct and preparation. They must intimately be related because failure in preparation leads to disaster on the battlefield. Chapter 4. The Conduct of War Now, an army may be likened to water. 
Just as flowing water avoids the heights and hastens to the lowlands, so an army avoids strength and strikes weakness. Sung Tzu. Speed is essence of war. Take advantage of the enemy's unpreparedness. Travel by unexpected routes and strike him where he has taken no precautions. Sung Tzu. The sole justification for the United States Marine Corps is to serve or protect national policy objectives by military force when peaceful means alone cannot. How the Marine Corps proposes to accomplish this mission is the product of our understanding of the nature and theory of war and must be the guiding force behind our preparation of war. The challenge. The challenge is to develop a concept of war fighting consistent with our understanding of the nature and theory of war and the realities of the modern battlefield. What exactly does this require? It requires a concept of war fighting that will help us function effectively as an uncertain, chaotic, and fluid environment. In fact, one with which we can exploit these conditions to our advantage. It requires a concept with which we can sense and use the time competitive rhythm of war to generate and exploit superior tempo. It requires a concept that is consistently effective across a full spectrum of conflict because we cannot attempt to change our basic doctrine from the situation to situation and expect it to be proficient. It requires a concept with which we can recognize and exploit the fleeting opportunities that naturally occur in war. It requires a concept that takes into the account the moral and mental as well as the physical forces of war because we have already concluded that these are form a greater part of war. And that requires a concept with which we can succeed against a numerically superior foe because we cannot presume numerical advantage either locally or overall, especially in expeditionary situations in which public support for military action may be tepid and short-lived. It requires a concept with which we can win quickly against a larger foe on his home soil or minimal casualties and limited external support. Maneuver Warfare The Marine Corps concept for winning under these conditions is a warfighting doctrine based on rapid flexibility and opportunistic maneuver. In order to fully appreciate what we mean by maneuver, we need to clarify the term. The traditional understanding of maneuver is a spatial one. That is, we maneuver in space to gain a positional advantage. However, in order to maximize the usefulness of maneuver, we must consider maneuver in other dimensions as well. The essence of maneuvering is taking action to generate and exploit some kind of advantage over the enemy as a means of accomplishing our objectives as efficiently as possible. That advantage may be psychological, technological, or temporal, as well as spatial. Especially important is maneuver in time. We generate a faster operating tempo than the enemy to gain a temporal advantage. It is through maneuver in all dimensions that an inferior force can achieve a decisive superiority in a necessary time and place. Maneuver Warfare is warfighting philosophy that seeks to shatter the enemy's cohesion through a variety of rapid, focused, and unexpected actions which create a turbulent, rapid, deteriorating situation in which the enemy cannot cope. Rather than wearing down the enemy's defenses, maneuver warfare attempts to bypass these defensives in order to penetrate the enemy's system and tear it apart. The aim is to render the enemy incapable of resisting effectively by shattering his moral, mental, and physical cohesion. This ability to fight as an effective coordinated whole rather than to destroy him physically through incremental attrition of each of his components, which is generally more costly and time-consuming. Ideally, the components of his physical strength that remain are irrelevant because they have disrupted his ability to use them effectively. 
Even if an outmaneuvered enemy continues to fight as individuals or small units, we can destroy the remnants with relative ease because we have eliminated his ability to fight efficiently as a force. This is not to imply that firepower is unimportant. On the contrary, firepower is central to maneuver in warfare. Nor do we mean to imply that we will bypass on the opportunity to physically destroy the enemy. We will concentrate fires and foes at decisive points and destroy the enemy elements at the opportunity presents itself and when it fits our larger purposes. Engaging in combat, we can rarely go wrong if we aggressively pursue the destruction of the enemy forces. In fact, maneuver warfare often involves extremely high attrition of selected enemy forces where we have focused combat power against critical enemy weakness. Nevertheless, the aim of such attrition is not merely to reduce incrementally the enemy's physical strength. Rather, it is to contribute to the enemy's systematic disruption. The greatest effect of firepower is generally not physical destruction, but the cumulative effects of which are felt only slowly, but the disruption it causes. If the aim of maneuver warfare is to shatter the cohesion of the enemy system, the immediate object towards that end is to create a situation in which the enemy cannot function. By our actions, we seek to pose menacing dilemmas into which events happen unexpectedly and more quickly than the enemy can keep up with. The enemy must be made to see the situation not only as deteriorating, but deteriorating at the increasing rate. The ultimate goal is to have panic and paralysis, an enemy who has lost the ability to resist. Inherent in maneuver warfare is the need for speed and the seize the initiative, dictate the terms of action, and keep the enemy off balance, thereby increasing his friction. We seek to establish a place that the enemy cannot maintain so that each action, his reactions are increasingly late, until eventually he is overcome by events. Also, inherent is the need to focus for efforts in order to maximize effect. In combat, this includes violence and shock effect. Again, not so much as a source of physical attrition, but as a source of disruption. We concentrate strength against the critical enemy vulnerabilities, striking quickly and boldly where, when, and in ways in which it will cause the greatest damage to our enemy's ability to fight. Once gained or found, any advantage will be pressed relentlessly and unhesitatingly. We must be ruthless, opportunistic, actively seeking out signs of weakness against which we will direct all available combat power. When the decisive opportunity arrives, we must exploit it fully and aggressively, committing every ounce of combat power we can muster and pushing ourselves to the limits of exhaustion. An important weapon in our arsenal is surprise, the combat value of which we have already recognized. By studying our enemy, we will attempt to appreciate his prescriptions. Through deception, we will try to shape the enemy's expectations. When we will exploit those expectations by striking at an unexpected time and place in order to appear unpredictable, we must avoid set rules and patterns which inhibit imagination and initiative. In order to appear ambiguous and threatening, we should operate on the axes that we offer numerous courses of action, keeping the enemy unclear as to which we will choose. Besides traits such as endurance and courage, that all warfare demands. Maneuver warfare puts a premium on a certain particular human skills and traits. It requires the temperament to cope with uncertainty. It requires flexibility of mind to deal with fluid, disorderly situations. It requires a certain independence of mind and a willingness to act with initiative and boldness an exploitive mindset that takes full advantage of every opportunity and the moral courage to accept responsibility for this type of behavior. It is important that 
this last set of traits be guided from self-discipline and loyalty to the objective of seniors. Finally, maneuver warfare requires the ability to think above our own level and to act our own level in a way that is consonance with the requirements of the larger situation. Orienting on the enemy. Orienting on the enemy is fundamental to maneuver warfare. Maneuver warfare attacks the enemy system. The enemy system is whatever constitutes the entity confronting us within our particular sphere. For a pilot, it may be a combination of air defense radars, surface air missiles, and enemy aircraft that must be penetrated to reach the target. For a rifle company commander, it might be mutually supporting defensive positions protected by obstacles and supported by crew serve weapons on the next terrain feature. For electronic warfare specialists, it might be the enemy's command and control networks. For enemy expeditionary force commander, it might be all the major combat formations within the area of operations as well as their supporting command and control logistics and intelligence organizations. We should try to understand the unique characteristics that make up the enemy system function so that we can penetrate the system, tear it apart, and, if necessary, destroy it, the isolated components. We should seek to identify and attack critical vulnerabilities and those centers of gravity without which the enemy cannot function effectively. This means focusing outward on the particular characteristics of the enemy rather than inward on the mechanical execution of a predetermined procedures. If the enemy system, for example, is a fortified defensive works, penetrating the system may mean an infiltration or violent attack on a narrow frontage at a weak spot to physically rupture the defense after which we can envelop an enemy position or roll them up laterally from within. In this way, we defeat the logic of the system rather than frontally overwhelming each position. We should try to get inside the enemy's thought processes and see the enemy as he sees himself so that we can set him up for defeat. It is essential that we understand the enemy on his own terms, we should not assume that every enemy thinks as we do, fights as we do, or has the same values or objectives. Philosophy of Command It is essential that our philosophy of command support the way we fight, first and foremost in order to generate the tempo of operations we desire to best cope with the uncertainty, disorder, and fluidity of combat. Command and control must be decentralized. That is, subordinate commanders must make the decision on their own initiative based on their understanding of the senior's intent, rather than passing information up the chain of command and waiting for the decision to be passed down. Further, a competent subordinate commander who is at the point of decision will naturally better appreciate the true situation than a senior commander some distance removed. Individual initiative and responsibility are paramount importance. The principal means by which the impotent decentralized command and control is through the use of mission tactics, which we will discuss in de later detail. Second, we have conducted that war is a human enterprise and that no amount of technology can reduce the human dimension. Our philosophy and command must be based on human characteristics rather than equipment or procedures communications equipment and command staff procedures can enhance our ability to command but they must not be used to lessen the human element of command our philosophy must not only accommodate but must exploit human traits such as boldness initiative personality strength of will and imagination our philosophy of command but must also exploit the human ability to communicate implicitly we believe that implicit communication to communicate through mutual understanding using minimum of key well-understood phrases or even anticipated each other's thoughts is a faster, more effective way to communicate than through the use of detailed explicit instructions. We develop this ability through familiarity and trust, which we are based on a shared philosophy and shared experience 
This concept has several practical implications. First, we should establish long-term working relationships to develop the necessary familiarity and trust. Second, key people, actuals, should talk directly to one another when possible, rather than through communicators or messengers. Third, we should communicate orally when possible, because we communicate also to how we talk, our inflections, and tone of voice. Fourth, we should communicate in person when possible because we communicate through our gestures and bearings. Commanders should command from where they can best influence the action, normally well-formed and well-forward. This allows them to see and sense firsthand the ebb and flow of combat, to gain the initiative and intuitive appreciation for the situation that they cannot obtain from reports. It allows them to exert personal influence at the decisive points during action. It also allows them to locate themselves closer to the events that will influence the situation so they can observe them and circumvent delays and inaccuracies that results in passing information up and down the chain of command. Finally, we recognize the importance of personal leadership, not only by their physical presence, by demonstrating the willingness to share danger and privation, can commanders fully gain trust and confidence in their subordinates. We must remember that command from the front should not equate to over-supervision of subordinates. At the same time, it's important to balance the need for forward command with the need for keeping an appeased of overall situation, which is often best done from central locations such as a command operation center. Commanders cannot become so focused on one aspect of the situation that they lose overall situational awareness. As one part of our philosophy of command, we must recognize that war is inherently disorderly, uncertain, dynamic, dominated by friction. Moreover, maneuver warfare with this emphasis on speed and initiative is by nature a particularly disorderly style of war. The conditions ripe for exploitation are normally also very disorderly. For commanders to try to gain certainty on a basis for actions, maintain positive control of all events of all times, or dictate events to fit their plans to deny the nature of war. They must therefore be prepared to cope even better to thrive in an environment of chaos. Uncertainty, constant change, and friction. If we can come to terms with those conditions and thereby limit their debilitating effects, we can use them as a weapon against a foe who does not know how to cope well. In practical terms, it means that we must not strive for certainty before we act, for in doing, we will surrender the initiative and pass up opportunities we must not only try to maintain excessive control over subordinates, since this will n necessarily slow our temple, but inhibit initiative. We must not attempt to impose precise order on the events of combat, since this leads to a formulaic approach to war. We must be prepared to adapt to changing circumstances and exploit opportunities as they will arise rather than adhering instantaneously to predetermined plans that have outlived their usefulness. There are several points worth remembering about our command philosophy. First, while it is based on the war fighting style, this does not mean that it is applied only during war. We must put into practice during the preparation for war as well. We cannot rightly expect our subordinates to exercise boldness and initiative in the field when they are accustomed to being over-supervised in garrison. Whether the mission is training, uh, procuring equipment, administration, or police call, this philosophy should be applicable. Next, our philosophy requires competent leaderships at all levels. A centralized system theoretically needs only one competent person a senior commander who is the sole authority. A decentralized system requires leaders at all levels to demonstrate sound and timely judgment. Initiative becomes an essential condition of competence among commanders. Our philosophy also requires familiarity amongst comrades because only through our shared understanding can we develop implicit communication necessary for the unity of effort. Perhaps 
most important, our philosophy demands confidence among seniors and subordinates. Shaping the action. Since our goal is not merely the cumulative attrition of the enemy strength, we must have some larger scheme of how we can expect to achieve victory. That is, before anything else, we must identify those critical enemy vulnerabilities that we believe that will lead to the most directly under undermining the enemy's centers of gravity and the accomplishment of our mission. Having done this, we can then begin to act and shape our campaign operation battle engagement to our advantage in both time and space. Similarly, we must try to see ourselves through the enemy's eyes in order to identify our own vulnerabilities that he may attack and anticipate what he will try to do so we can counteract him. Ideally, when the moment of engagement arrives, the issue will have already been resolved. Through our influencing in the events leading up to the encounter. We have also shaped the conditions of war and that the result of this matter, of course, we have shaped the action decisively to our advantage. To influence the action of our advantage, we must project our thoughts forward in time and space. We frequently do this through planning. This does not mean that we establish detailed timetable of events. We have already concluded that war is inherently disorderly, and we cannot expect to dictate its terms with any sort of precision. Rather, we attempt in the shape of general conditions of war. This shaping consists of lethal and non-lethal actions that span the spectrum of direct attack to psychological operations, from electronic warfare to stockpiling of critical supplies for future operations. Shaping activities may render the enemy vulnerable to attack, facilitating maneuver of friendly forces and dictating the time and place for a decisive battle. Examples include canalizing enemy movement in the direction desired, blocking or delaying the enemy reinforcements so that we can fight in a fragmented enemy force, or shaping enemy expectations through deception so that we can exploit those expectations we can attack a specific enemy capability to allow us to maximize the capability of our own, such as launching an operation to destroy the enemy's air defense so that we can maximize the use of our own aviation. Through shaping, commanders gain the initiative, preserve momentum, and control tempo of operations. We should also try to shape events in a way that allows us several options so that by the time of the moment for decisive operations arrives, we have not restricted ourselves to only one course of action. The further ahead we think, the less our actual influence can be. Therefore, further ahead we consider, the less precision we should attempt to impose. Looking ahead thus becomes less a matter of direct influence and more a matter of laying the groundwork for possible future actions. As events approach the ability to influence them grows, we have already developed an appreciation for the situation and how we want to shape it. The higher our echelon of command, the greater our sphere of influence, and the further ahead in time and space we must seek to shape the action. Senior commanders developing and pursuing military strategy look ahead weeks, months, and even more in their areas of influence and interest will encompass entire theaters. Junior commanders fighting in the battles engagements at hand are concerned with the uh, coming hours, even minutes, and the immediate field of battle regardless of the sphere in which we operate. It is essential to have some vision of the result we want and how we intend to shape the action in time and space and achieve it. Decision making is essential to the conduct of war since actions are the result of decisions or non-decisions. If we fail to make a decision out of the lack of will, then we have willingly surrendered an initiative to our foe. If we consciously postpone taking action for some reason, that is a decision. Thus, a basis for action, any decision, is generally better than no decision. Since war 
is a conflict between opposing wills. We cannot make decisions in a vacuum. We must make our decisions in light of the enemy's anticipated reactions and counter-reactions, recognizing that while we are trying to impose our will on the enemy, he is trying to do the same to us. Time is a critical factor in the effective decision-making, often the most important factor. The key part of effective decision-making is realizing how much decision time is available and making the most of that time in general. Whoever can make and implement decisions consistently faster gains tremendous, often decisive, advantage. Decision making and execution thus becomes time cooperative process. The timelessness of decisions becomes essential to generating tempo. Timely decision demand rapid thinking and consideration limited to, limited to essential factors. In such situations, we must spare no effort to accelerate our decision-making ability. That said, we should also recognize that those situations in which time is not a limiting factor, such as a deliberate planning or situations, we should not rush our decisions unnecessarily. A military decision is not merely a mathematical computation. Decision making requires both situational awareness to recognize the essence of a given problem and the creative ability to devise a practical solution. These abilities are the pr products of experience, education, and intelligence. Decision making may be an intuitive process based on experience, and this will likely be the case at lower levels in it fluid, uncertain situations. Alternatively, decision-making may be more analytical process based on comparing several operations, and this will more likely be the case at higher levels or at deliberate planning situations. We should base our decisions on awareness rather than our mechanical habit. That is, we can act on keen appreciation for the essential factors that make each situation unique instead from conditioned response. We must have the moral courage to make tough decisions in face of uncertainty and to accept full responsibility for those decisions. When the natural inclination would be to postpone the decision pending more complete information to delay action in an emergency because of incomplete information shows a lack of moral courage and we do not want to make rash decisions but we must not squander opportunities while trying to gain more information finally since all decisions must be made in face of uncertainty since every situation is unique there is no perfect situation to any battlefield problem furthermore we should not agonize over one the essence of a problem is to select a promising course of action with an acceptable degree of risk and do it more quickly than our foe in this respect a good plan violently executed now is better than a perfect plan executed next week mission tactics one key way to put maneuver warfare into practice is through the use of mission tactics mission tactics is just as the name implies the tactics of the assigning a subordinate mission without specifying how a mission must be accomplished we leave the commander of accomplishing the mission to the subordinate thereby allowing the freedom and establishing the duty for the subordinate to take whatever steps deemed necessary based on the situation the mission tactics relies on the subordinate exercise of initiative framed by the proper guidance and understanding mission tactics benefit the senior commander by freeing time to focus on higher level concerns rather than details of subordinate execution. The senior prescribes the method of execution only through the degree that is essential for coordination. The senior intervenes in the subordinate's execution only by exception. It is this freedom for initiative that permits the high tempo of operations that we desire, uninhibited by excessive restrictions from above. Subordinates can adapt their actions to the changing situation. They can inform the commander of what they have done, but they do not wait for permission. 
mission tactics serves as a contract between senior and subordinate. The senior agrees to provide the subordinate with the support necessary to help them accomplish their mission, but without the unnecessary prescribing of their actions. The senior is obligated to provide the guidance that allows the subordinate to exercise proper judgment and initiative. The subordinate is obligated to act in conformity with the intent of the senior. The subordinate agrees to act responsibly and loyally and not to exceed proper limits of authority. Mission tactics require subordinates to act with topsight, a grasp of how their actions fit to the larger situation. In other words, subordinates must always think above their own level in order to contribute to the accomplishment of the higher mission. It is obvious that we cannot allow decentralized initiative without some means of providing unity or forces to the various efforts. To do so would be to dissipate our strength. We seek unity, not principally through imposed control, but through harmonious initiative and lateral coordination within the context provided by the guidance from above. The commander's intent. We achieve this harmonious initiative in part through the use of the commander's intent, a device designed to help subordinates understand the larger context of their actions. The purpose of providing intent is to allow subordinates to exercise judgment and initiative to depart the original plan when unforeseen of events occur in a way that is consistent with the higher commander's aims. There are two parts to any mission. The task is to be accomplished and the reason or the intent behind it. The intent is thus a part of every mission. The task describes the action to be taken while the intent describes the purpose of the action. The task denotes what is to be done and sometimes when and where. The intent explains why. Of the two, the intent is predominant. While the situation may change, making the task obsolete, the intent is more lasting and continues to guide our actions. Understanding the intent of our commander allows us to exercise initiative in harmony with the commander's desires. The intent for the unit is established by the commanders assigning that unit's mission. Usually, the next higher commander, although not always. A commander normally provides intent as part of a mission statement assigned to a subordinate. A subordinate commander who is not given a clean purpose to the assigned mission should not ask for one. Based on the mission, the commander then develops the concept of operations, which explains how the unit will be accomplishing the mission and assigns missions to subordinates. Each subordinate mission statement includes an intent for the subordinate. An intent provided to each subordinate should contribute to the accomplishment of the intent a commander has received from above. This top-down flow to intent provides consistency and continuity to our actions and establishes the context that is essential for proper bottom-up exercise of initiative, it is often possible to capture intent in a simple, in quotes, in order to, dot, 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 phrase following the assigned task. To maintain our focus of the enemy, we can often express intent in terms of the enemy. For example, control the bridge in order to prevent the enemy from escaping across the river. Sometimes it may be necessary to provide amplifying guidance in addition to an dot 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 in order to statement. In any event, a commander statement of any intent should be brief and compelling. The more concise, the better. A subordinate should be ever conscious of the commander's intent so that it guides every decision. An intent that is involved or complicated will fail to accomplish this purpose. A clear expression of an understanding of intent is essential to the unity of effort. The burden of understanding falls on the senior and subordinate alike. The seniors must make their purposes proficiently clear, but in a way that does not inhibit initiative. 
subordinates must have a clear understanding of what their commander expects. Further, they should understand that the intent of the commander is at least two levels up. Main Effort Another important tool for providing unity is the main effort. Of all the actions going on within our command, we recognize one as the most critical to success at that moment. The unit assigned responsibility for accomplishing this key mission is designated as the main effort, the focal point on which converges the combat power of the force. The main effort receives priority for support of any kind. It becomes clear to all other units in the command that they must support that unit in accomplishment of its mission. Like the commander's intent, the main effort becomes a harmonizing force for the subordinate initiative. Faced with the decision, we ask ourselves, how can I best support the main effort? We cannot take lightly this decision which unit will de designate the main effort. In effect, we have decided. This is how I will achieve a decision. Everything else is secondary. We have carefully designed the operation so that the success by the main effort ensures that the success of the entire mission. Since the main effort represents the primary bid for victory, we must direct it at an object which will have the most significant effect on the enemy, which holds the best opportunity of success. The main effort involves physical and moral commitment, although not an ir irretrievable one. It forces us to concentrate decisive combat power just as it forces us to accept risk. Thus, we direct our main effort against the center of gravity through the critical enemy vulnerability, exercising strict economy elsewhere. Each commander should establish a main effort for each operation. As the situation changes, the commander may shift the main effort, redirecting the weight of combat power in the support of the unit that is now the most cr critical to success in general when shifting the main effort. We seek to exploit success rather than reinforce failure. Surfaces and gaps. To put simply, surfaces are hard spots. Enemy strengths and gaps are soft spots. Enemy weaknesses. We avoid strengths and we focus our efforts against weaknesses with object of penetrating the enemy system since pitting strength against weakness reduces casualties and is more likely to yield decisive results. Whenever possible, we exploit existing gaps. Failing that, we create gaps. Gaps, in fact, may be physical gaps in the enemy's dispositions. They also may be any weakness in time, space, or capability. A moment in time the enemy is overexposed in, and vulnerable. A seam in the air defense umbrella. An infantry unit caught unprepared in an open terrain or a boundary between two units. Similarly, a surface may be an actual strong point or it may be any enemy strength. A moment when the enemy has just replenished and has consolidated a position or a technological superiority of particular weapon system or capability. In anticipation for surfaces and gaps requires a certain amount of judgment. What is the surface in one case may be a gap in another. For example, a forest, which is the surface to an armored unit because it restricts vehicle movement, can be a gap in the infantry unit, which can infiltrate through it. Furthermore, we can expect the enemy to disguise his dispositions in order to lure us against a surface that appears to be a gap. Due to a fluid nature of war, gaps will rarely be permanent and will usually be feeding. To exploit them, demands flexibility and speed. We must actively seek out gaps and continuous aggressive reconnaissance. Once we locate them, we'll exploit them by funneling our forces through rapidly. For example, if our main effort has struck the surface, but another unit has located a gap, we designate the second unit as the main effort and redirect our combat power to support it. 
In this manner, we pull combat power through gaps the front rather than pushing it from the rear. Commanders must rely on the initiative of subordinates to locate gaps and must have the flexibility to respond quickly to opportunities rather than blindly follow predetermined schemes. Combined Arms In order to maximize combat power, we must use all available resources to the best advantage. We do so. We must follow a doctrine of combined arms. Combined arms is a full integration of arms in such a way that to counteract one, the enemy must become more vulnerable to the other. We pose the enemy not just with a problem, but with a dilemma, a no-win situation. We accomplish combined arms through the tactics and techniques we use at lower levels and through task organization at higher levels. In so doing, we take advantage of the complementary characteristics of different types of units and enhance our mobility and firepower. We use each arm for the mission that no other arm can perform as well. For example, we assign aviation, a task that cannot be performed equally as well as artillery. An example of the concept of combined arms at the very lowest level is a complementary use of the automatic weapon and grenade launcher within a fire team. We pin down the enemy with higher volume, direct volume of fire with the automatic we weapon and making him vulnerable target for the grenade launcher. If he moves to escape the impact of the grenades, we engage him with the automatic weapon. We can expand this example to the MAGTAF level. We use the assault support aircraft to quickly concentrate superior ground forces for breakthrough. We use artillery and close air support to support the infantry penetration, and we use deep air support to indirect enemy reinforcements that move to contain the penetration. Targets which cannot be effectively supported by artillery are engaged by close air support in order to defend against the infantry attack. The enemy must make himself vulnerable to supporting arms. If he seeks cover from that supporting position, our infantry can maneuver against him. In order to block our penetration, the enemy must reinforce quickly without his reserve. However, in order to avoid deep air support, he must stray off the roads, which means he can only move slowly. And if he moves slowly, he cannot remain a force in time to prevent our breakthrough, and we have put him in a dilemma. Conclusion we have discussed the aim and characteristics of maneuver warfare, and we have discussed the philosophy of command necessary to support this style of warfare, and we have discussed some of the tactics of maneuver warfare, but this time, it should be clear that maneuver warfare exists not so much in the specific methods used. We do not believe in a formulistic approach to war, but in the mind of a marine, there is a regard maneuver warfare like combined arms applies equally to the marine expeditionary force commander and to the fire team leader. It applies regardless to the nature of the conflict, whether amphibious operations or sustained operations ashore, of low or high intensity against guerrilla or mechanized foe in desert or jungle. Maneuver war is a way of thinking in and about war that should shape every action. It is the state of mind born of the bold will, intellect, initiative, and ruthless optimism. It is the state of mind bent on shattering the enemy morale and physically by paralyzing and confounding him, by avoiding his strength, by quickly and aggressively exploiting his vulnerabilities and by striking him in a way that will hurt him most. In short, maneuver warfare is a philosophy for generating the greatest decisive effect against the enemy at the least possible cost to ourselves, a philosophy for fighting smart. This has been the conclusion of 
MCDP-1 Warfighting, United States Marine Corps Publication. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Smash the bell for more updates.